Rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. These are Warren Buffett's top two rules on investing, but today many investors are setting themselves up to break these two rules. Investing is often exciting because of the gains we see. However, in this video, we'll be covering the other side of the equation and avoid losing money by building a crash-proof portfolio that will help protect you against the next stock market crash. We'll cover five portfolios, three of which could potentially be a good starting point for building a crash-proof portfolio that can survive any economic conditions. In addition, we'll be going over some very useful tools that can help provide a framework for making investing decisions on how you allocate your money within your portfolio. Because portfolio allocation or how you allocate your capital within your portfolio is one of the most fundamental questions an investor faces, this will be one of the most important videos I've done so far and will provide tremendous value to both beginners and experienced investors. With that being said, there's a lot to cover, so let's jump into it. First, let's provide a little bit of perspective. Now, remember Warren Buffett's first two rules, never lose money? In this case, it looks like investing in the S&P 500, at least over the last nine years, has followed those rules to a T. However, only looking at the bull side of a market cycle doesn't provide the full picture of what investing in equities is really like. If we zoom out a little bit and look over the past 25 years, we can see there have actually been two cases where we broke Warren's first two rules. During the 2000 and 2008 crashes, investors lost a lot of money, which is better represented percentage-wise by using a logarithmic scale. Breaking these first two rules and losing money meant that investors who invested in equities during 2000 had to wait over 13 years before they saw any gains again. And the simple counter argument to this is that, well, stocks did recover, and currently we're just a little bit off of all-time highs. And while that's certainly true, I think it's important not to take for granted the economic circumstances under which that occurred. If you take a look at the consumer price index over the last 50 years, we have been in periods of severe inflation in the past. This puts pressure on the prices of both bonds and stocks. However, since the financial crisis, we've had some of the lowest reported inflation numbers over the last 50 years. This means we've had absolutely no inflationary headwinds that could put pressures on equity prices. Additionally, since the early 1980s, interest rates have been falling steadily for the past four decades. While recently increasing over the last two years, interest rates have remained at historic lows and certainly at the lowest rates over the last 50 years. This is important to consider because decreasing and low interest rates tend to increase stock prices because there's fewer alternatives in the bond market for a competitive return on your investment. In addition, since the financial crisis, we have not encountered any significant recession, which would impede our GDP growth. And furthermore, since the 1980s, the valuation of the stock market has been increasing above historical norms. What this means is that investors are willing to pay more in terms of price of a stock for the same amount of earnings. Effectively, you're getting less bang for your buck as an investor. However, rising valuations do increase the price of stocks, which has been a tailwind for equities since the financial crisis. In this case, valuations represented from the Schiller P.E. ratio are at the second highest point in history. Now, the reason I mention that is that this most recent bull market has been experiencing the Goldilocks scenario for stocks. You have low inflation, low and decreasing interest rates, steady economic growth, and increasing stock valuations. So it shouldn't really come as a surprise to see a bull market as strong as the one we've seen since the financial crisis. However, this too shall pass, and eventually we'll be confronted with less favorable economic conditions and correspondingly worse performance and overall returns in the stock market. And to help understand that risk in less favorable economic situations, we'll be using a tool called Portfolio Charts to help examine those risks. Now, I've only recently found this resource, but after playing with it for a couple of days, I think it's one of the best visualization tools that investors can use to help understand the risk that's involved with different types of portfolios in different economic conditions. This is extremely important for two reasons. First, because portfolio allocation or how you allocate your capital across different asset classes within your portfolio is one of the greatest single determinants of how your portfolio will perform in the future. Portfolio allocation is many times more important than security selection or which stocks you might choose to buy or hold in your portfolio. And second, because risk can sometimes be hard to see, especially during a bull market. If you looked at the price of the S&P 500 over the last nine years and had no other information, you would assume it's a relatively safe investment. However, in reality, there's a significant amount of market risk involved with investing with stocks. 
To help demonstrate and visualize those risks, we'll be looking at our first portfolio, which is a 100% allocation to the total stock market index. Now there's an inherent bias, especially towards people who are young, to push them towards an equity heavy portfolio oftentimes 90% or 100% equities. This is done with the justification that if you look at the total stock market and their annual returns, it typically has one of the highest annual returns of most portfolios. However, as we'll explore in just a second, these types of portfolios are not suited for everyone. And even if you have a long-term mindset, which you should when you're investing, the volatility that can come with these equity-heavy portfolios is not fun for an investor to sit through, especially if your stocks are down 30, 40, or 50%. In this case, while the average historical returns have been quite strong, the variability of those returns has been quite high, especially in the short term. In this case, this graph is showing that after investing in the total stock market index for 10 years, that your median annual return with this portfolio would be 7.6% per year. However, there's a 15% chance based on historical performance that your annual return could have been as low as 1% per year. This means about a sixth of the time, if you invest in the stock market, 10 years later, you'll barely see any results. This risk is shown more concretely with this drawdown graph, which I think is actually one of the best visualization tools for understanding the risk in a portfolio. In this case, the drawdown represents the furthest down your stocks will go before recovering back to your previous high. In the case of US stocks since 1970, the worst and deepest drawdown has been around 50%, while the longest has been just over 13 years. Now, if you combine those two data points, you can create a third risk measurement, which is called the ulcer index. The ulcer index effectively measures the severity of these drawdowns and is used as a relative metric for how painful holding these portfolios can be. In this case, portfolios with drawdowns that are extended over a long period of time or are particularly severe and deep are considered more painful than those portfolios that have drawdowns that are relatively shallow or don't last very long. The ulcer index does a much better job of characterizing portfolio risk in this case than traditional metrics like standard deviation. To demonstrate this, take a look at these three portfolios and of these three, which do you personally think is the riskiest? Now for most people, the answer is very clear. The magenta line is obviously the most riskiest, while the yellow line is the least riskiest and most stable. However, by traditional metrics of risk like standard deviation, each of these portfolios is considered exactly the same. That's because standard deviation only looks at how each daily return is different from the average and doesn't consider the order. That's the reason that these portfolios all have the same standard deviation. The blue line represents actual market returns. The magenta line has them sorted from worst to best, meaning all the worst days come first and then the best days at the end. And the yellow line is sorted with positive returns following negative returns. I hope this gets the point across that one should be skeptical of metrics of risk like standard deviation, simply because they don't take into account the order of those returns and the severity of those drawdowns. And then it's simply based on past data. So if you see a period of returns that are very strong in the market, like we have since 2009, then standard deviation is going to be low. And a low standard deviation, as you can see, does not necessarily mean low risk. Additionally, if you look at the heat map of annual returns, so if you started investing in this portfolio at any given year, it tracks what your annual return would be X number of years past your start date. In this case, dark blue is annual returns over 9%, medium blue is annual returns over 6%, Light blue's annual returns over 3%, white is returns between 0 and 3% per year, and anything pink or red is negative returns per year. With this, we can see that the majority of negative returns in the stock market were concentrated around a few years, particularly 1972 to 1974, 2000 to 2002, and then 2007 and 2008. So if our goal is not to lose money, it's going to be challenging to be relying only on equities for our portfolio. Given that, let's take a look at our second portfolio, which is very well accepted in the industry, which is a classic 60% allocation to stocks and a 40% allocation to bonds. Adding bonds is a way to diversify some of the market risk 
that comes with owning stocks in your portfolio. For this portfolio, the stock allocation will be represented by the US total stock market and the bond allocation by intermediate term bonds. So how's this portfolio compare for returns? Well, on average, the portfolio is producing a lower return, so 5.9%, compared to the 7.9% of the total stock market index. However, with the addition of the bonds, the variability of those returns has decreased. In this case, the minimum 10-year return on this portfolio has been minus 1.4% annually compared to the total stock market index which saw a minus 3.3% return annually during a period of 10 years. And from a drawdown perspective, the 60-40 portfolio looks a lot better with the worst drawdown being now only 34% instead of 49%, but the longest drawdown still lasted 12 years, which is only a slight improvement from 13 years. The ulcer index for this portfolio is around 10, which represents about a 40% reduction in portfolio pain compared to the total stock market index. And here we can see the heat map returns for this 60-40 portfolio. So from a risk adjusted perspective, this looks like an improvement, but can we do even better? And the answer is yes. And that's where we start to look into our next three portfolios, which are designed to be quote unquote crash proof. The idea with these types of portfolios is that they're designed to be more diverse across different types of asset classes that produce more consistent annual returns, not just when the conditions are right for stocks. The first one of these is hedge fund manager Ray Dalio's all-weather portfolio. This portfolio has a 30% allocation to stocks, a 40% allocation to long-term bonds, a 15% allocation to intermediate-term bonds, and then a 7.5% allocation to gold, and a seven and a half allocation to commodities. Now, two things you'll notice across the bat with this portfolio is that it's much less weighted towards stocks and has the addition of real assets like commodities and gold. This is done because since stocks can be so volatile as an asset class, increasing the proportion of the portfolio in bonds and adding the addition of real assets like commodities and gold can help diversify more effectively away from that stock market risk. So let's see how this portfolio actually does. In this case, the average return since 1970 was 5.5%, which is a slight reduction from the 60-40 portfolio, which had a 5.9% average return. The question then remains, does it lower the risk? In this case, the volatility of annual returns does seem to be reduced. We're looking at a median 10-year return of 5.8% percent with a baseline of 3.5 percent. Again, the baseline scenario represents that 85 percent of the time you'll get a 10-year return above this value. Now that 3.5 percent is a significant improvement over the 1.9 percent baseline that we saw with the 60-40 stock bond portfolio. Where we see the best improvements though on a risk basis is in the drawdowns. In this case, Ray Dalio's all-weather portfolio had a worse drawdown of only 16 percent and the longest of 10 years. This produces an exceptionally low ulcer index of 3.5. If you compare that to the 60-40 portfolio, it is a very big improvement. And then comparing that to the total stock market index, there's really no comparison to be had on a risk-adjusted basis. While you are giving up some potential for higher returns, the variability of these returns is significantly less and you're more likely to get consistent positive returns in the future. So overall, the all-weather portfolio does seem to do a good job of improving our risk-adjusted returns, but can we do better? With that, we'll take a look at our fourth portfolio, which is the permanent portfolio. Now, this portfolio was originally proposed by Harry Brown in his book, Fail Safe Investing. The idea behind this portfolio is that it's split evenly into four different asset classes, 25% in stocks, 25% in long-term bonds, 25% in treasury bills or cash, and 25% in gold. The justification being that at least one of these asset classes would be performing well in any given economic scenario. Let's see how it did. In this case, the permanent portfolio has the lowest average return of any of the portfolios that we've looked at over this period with an average return of 5% annually. This is likely due to the high allocation of treasury bills and cash in the portfolio maintained at 25%. It is noted that short-term bonds are sometimes substituted for investors who pursue a permanent portfolio strategy. Where things get interesting is the volatility of annual returns. In this case, since 1970, there's been no 10-year period where you've seen a negative annual return with this portfolio. Maybe even more impressive is that there's been no six-year period where you've seen a negative return with this portfolio. However, to compensate for that, the portfolio average return is much lower than the portfolios we've covered so far, and is sitting at a median return of 4.6%. But check out these drawdowns. The permanent portfolio's deepest drawdown was just 14%, 
and the longest five years. This has the lowest ulcer index of the portfolios we've covered so far at 2.4. So that's pretty impressive. Over 48 years, the worst this portfolio has ever done in any period of time is just being down 14%. And you've never lost money over a five year period. So as you can see from the heat map, the permanent portfolio has had consistent results, although at a slightly lower rate of return than the other portfolios that we've seen. So you already know what the next question is, can we do even better? And with that, we'll introduce our fifth portfolio, also known as the Golden Butterfly. The description states, matching the high return of the total stock market with the low volatility of the permanent portfolio, the Golden Butterfly is a homegrown portfolio chart sample portfolio that combines some of the best features of other asset allocations into a stable and efficient asset allocation for accumulation and retirement alike. So let's check this out. The Golden Butterfly is a split portfolio within five equal sections. 20% for the total stock market index, 20% for small cap value stocks, 20% for long-term bonds, 20% for short-term bonds, and 20% for gold. Now the potential reason for allocating more capital towards small cap value stocks is because those types of stocks have tended to have an overperformance compared to the general stock market over a long period of time. So the returns on the Golden Butterfly portfolio are actually very impressive. It's managed to get an average return of 6.5%, which is higher than the permanent portfolio, higher than the all weather portfolio, and even higher than the classic 60% stock 40% bond portfolio. Where the golden butterfly really shines is in the consistency of its returns. What's incredible is that over the last 48 years, this portfolio has worked like clockwork, generating consistent results for its investors. What I find really shocking is that there's been no three year period where you've lost money with this portfolio over the last 50 years. The drawdown graph is barely there because the drawdowns are so small. In this case, the deepest drawdown with this portfolio was just 11%, and the longest drawdown was just over two years. With an ulcer index of 2.6, this is one of the least volatile portfolios, but still produces consistent returns. This portfolio has done exceptionally well at producing consistent returns through all types of economic conditions, whether that's through rising inflation and interest rates through the 1970s and 80s, during both recessionary periods and growth periods, and regardless of the levels of stock valuations. As you can see from this chart of the rolling 15-year returns, every period that you've been invested in for 15 years since 1970 has been above 5% per year and it's remarkably consistent. So those are our five portfolios, three of which can provide a good foundation for building a crash-proof portfolio and one that particularly shines, which is the Golden Butterfly portfolio. Now I want to share two more additional tools that can be useful to you in helping you explore and find an asset allocation that is best suited for you. After that, I'll respond to a few reasonable objections that could come to using these strategies, and then I'll leave you with some final thoughts and a framework for making these investment decisions. So the first of these tools is actually a portfolio finder. Now what this portfolio finder does is that it gives you a menu of asset classes to choose from. You can then pick up to 10 of them to either consider having them in your portfolio or make it required that this asset class is in your portfolio. In this case, if you wanna designate the total stock market index as a required component in your portfolio, you'd mark it with an R and any other asset classes that you'd consider mark with a C. What this finder will then do after you've selected up to 10 assets in your portfolio, it will cycle through every possible combination of those asset classes and select the portfolio with the best risk adjusted returns. You can further filter these portfolios by setting a minimum baseline return as well as a maximum ulcer index or metric for portfolio pain. After analyzing all these portfolios, the finder will give you the top 10 portfolios with the best risk adjusted return, which takes into account their baseline return and their portfolio risk measured by the ulcer index. This can help you get a good idea of which portfolios tend to provide the best returns for the least amount of risk. One thing that I think is interesting to note here is that within all of the top 10 portfolios, notice there's at least one slice of the allocation that's going towards gold. I'll be discussing gold in a future video, but the reason why it's included in a lot of these portfolios is because it does an excellent job of mitigating some of the risk from stocks and bonds particularly during high inflation environments. However, if you're not interested in owning certain asset classes, you can simply remove them from the finder 
by setting them to blank. In this case, the portfolio finder will automatically recalculate and give you a new set of top 10 risk adjusted portfolios. So this is an incredible exploratory tool that I highly encourage you to take a look at and help understand what types of portfolios tend to have the best risk adjusted returns. In addition, in the portfolio section, if you select my portfolio, it will bring you to this calculator, which allows you to input your own portfolio allocation, either as it stands or a portfolio allocation you're interested in exploring. And it will provide you with the historical returns as well as risk profiles of that portfolio. So for instance, you can take a look at your asset allocation and current portfolio and take a look at what the historical drawdowns have been for your portfolio. You can then ask yourself, is this a portfolio I would be comfortable having a 34% drawdown and a long drawdown of over 12 years? Understand that that's at least a possibility. And if you're not comfortable with that possibility, maybe consider adjusting your portfolio to reduce the likelihood and risk of those drawdowns. Overall, I think this entire website is a fantastic resource, but definitely check out both the My Portfolio section where you can calculate your own portfolio, as well as the Portfolio Finder to explore some different portfolio options. Now I want to address a few reasonable objections. The first of which is that these portfolios are back-tested or fitted against historical data, and that historical data only lasts for 48 years. The implication being here is that this portfolio finder is simply fitting the best portfolio to the data in the past, but it might not be predicative of future returns. Additionally, you can make an argument that 50 years of historical data is not enough to cover all economic conditions. And to that, I'd say that's a perfectly reasonable objection and honestly is quite fair. I will say though that within this 50 years of data, we have seen at least a variety of economic conditions, both periods of growth and periods where we've seen recessions, periods of high inflation and rising interest rates, as well as decreasing inflation and decreasing interest rates. Part of the reason why the data only goes back to 1970 is because prior to that, there was not free market data on the price of gold. At that time, the price of gold was fixed by the US government and thus was not a good indication of the true market price of gold prior to 1970. And I would agree with you that past performance is not indicative of future results. However, I'd be willing to bet that the golden butterfly portfolio will be less risky than the total stock market portfolio. And the second objection would be even the consideration of having gold within a portfolio. Now, gold is a very polarizing asset class. Some see the value in gold, while others treat it as a barbellic relic. And Warren Buffett has called it just a shiny object that produces no real returns. Now, I will have a full video on this coming in the future, but just keep in mind that gold can play a useful role in a portfolio as it can help diversify away from market risk in stocks, as well as interest rate risk in bonds and help improve a portfolio's risk adjusted returns. So I'll leave you with some final thoughts and some ideas to use as a framework for making your investment decisions. Now I understand it can be very tempting to look at the total stock market index and look here at the average return and see that it's been the highest historically over time. However, it's important to keep in mind that since this data is from 1970, the valuations of stocks since 1970 have increased significantly. And these valuations can come down just as quickly as they came up. On a relative basis, if you look at the peaks in valuation since 1970, they've been highest in 2000, 2008, as well as now. And if you take a look at the total stock market return heat map over those same periods of time, you'll notice that 2000 and 2008 were not great times to be fully invested in stocks. Given that we're in a period of high valuations right now, my thinking is not to try and chase the high returns from stocks, but to think more about the downside risk in my portfolio. In this case, my current asset allocation is more conservative than a total stock market index, like the golden butterfly, for instance. And that's because I'm cognizant of the risks involved investing in the total stock markets, particularly at high valuations. Notice that all these crash-proof portfolios, the all-weather portfolio, the permanent portfolio, and the golden butterfly portfolio don't completely remove their asset allocation to stocks. However, it's a lot more conservative, which is part of the reason why it's shown more consistent returns in the past. So when thinking about crash-proofing your portfolio, think in terms of historical context of where we are and where we might go. I hope you have a better sense of the options available to you and the portfolio allocations you can use to help protect yourself against a stock market crash. Well, if you've made it this far and haven't yet subscribed, you really should at this point. And if you want even more content, I'll have a suggested video for you here. As always, thank you all for watching. My name is Michael, and I will see you in the next video.